So I want to welcome all of you. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this uh, Alumni Association uh, uh, webinar. Uh, we are organizing these webinars uh, since uh, a few months ago, actually, uh, with a good success. I think we had very interesting uh, lectures uh, over the months. And today we have two very interesting topics. Uh, we have uh, two speakers uh, we all know. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, Professor Abida Shah. The second is uh, uh, Dr. Dilshad Mamadaliev. Uh, I want to first of all uh, thank Professor Yoko Kato uh, for always giving us her support. And I ask, please, uh, my co chair, Dr. Ishu, Professor Ishu Bishnoi, to uh, introduce uh, our first speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, dear Alberto. So I, I will invite our first speaker, Professor Abida Shah. Uh, she is working as assistant professor at KEM Hospital, Mumbai from 2011. She is a gold medalist neurosurgeon and completed her training in uh, 2011. After that, uh, Professor did a fellowship in endovascular neurosurgery from Mayo Clinic, Mumbai. She has published 126 papers and written 14 book chapters and presented in 70 national and international conferences. She is recipient of multiple awards and she is a, a member of editorial board of International Journal of Neurosciences and associate editor of Journal of Craniovertebral Junction and Spine. She is also a educational chair of uh, WINS section of ACNS and she has keen interest in endovascular vascular neurosurgery and skull base surgery and uh, neuro-oncology. Today she will speak about uh, an interesting topic, white fiber dissection and its implications in neurosurgery. So I would like to invite our first speaker, Professor, please. Thank you, Professor Kato for inviting me. Thank you, ACNS <laughs> for having me here and thank you all the co-chairs and the moderators and the panelists of this session. So I will start sharing my screen now. Okay, so that was just a video that showed how intricate the white fibers of the brain are and how it is important to identify and protect these white fibers while working on them, while working on interaction brain tumors. So this is just a table showing the various white fibers of the brain and what happens if you damage these white fibers. So my interest in white fibers began a long time ago. I started in probably 2007 or 2008, and the interest has persisted. And based on the continuous white fiber dissections I'm doing, I have come to some conclusions and some understanding of this white fiber system, which I would like to share with you today. So I published this, we published this paper in 2018, where we divided the white fibers of the brain according to its architecture and its direction and depth. So we divided into these five layers. There were four horizontal layers and one vertical layer. So the horizontal layer, the first one was this yellow circle here of the short arcuate fibers. The second layer was this middle layer of long association fibers. You can see this blue circle. The third layer was this deep layer red circle or the association fibers that are in proximity to the ventricle. And this green circle is the fourth layer, horizontal layer or the central group of commissural fibers. And along with them, there is one vertical group of fibers, that is the projection fibers, which if you see in this image, this blue structure is the projection fibers. It runs right in the middle of the hemisphere and it divides the middle group of association fibers into a medial half and a lateral half. So fibers which are on this side of the projection system do not cross over to that side and fibers which are on this side do not cross to the other side. The only exception to this rule is the anterior commissure, which runs from underneath the internal capsule. So this is the classification that we proposed. And based on this classification, we went in to analyze how gliomas originate and spread. And in a recent paper we have just published, uh, it is our understanding that gliomas arise from a named white, white fiber tract. It grows along that white fiber tract and it displaces the adjoining normal white fiber tracks. So this is the first paper that we published where we have classified 
gliomas based on its radiological and anatomical extensions. And you can see here, we divided it into two types, a localized group and a diffuse group. So the localized group, as you can see here, included fibers, included gliomas that arose from the short arcuate fibers. Basically, they remained confined to a gyrus, spread to the other gyrus only by means of their short arcuate connection between the two gyri. And the next group was the diffuse group, which consisted of gliomas arising from the long association fibers. As you can see here, this is the cingulum. And how, how you can see that the glioma projects along the cingulum. I will show you in multiple images how this is very clearly seen in radiologically and during surgery. So this is a diffuse group that spreads along the long association fibers along its length. And this is another, the other diffuse group that arises from commissural fibers. And the, the importance of this is that it spreads bilateral. As you know, fibers, uh, gliomas of the corpus callosum tend to be bilateral and you have butterfly gliomas. So these are two, three things that we've understood while uh, doing performing white fiber dissections. There are many approaches that we have devised and let me start and start by taking, taking you through them. So this magnificent structure of the brain, you can see the hemisphere that is lying, resting on the anterior and middle skull base. And you can see all the vasculature that are present in the sulci and over the surface of the hemisphere. Once you remove the leptomeninges and the vasculature, this is what you'll see, the naked brain with all its lobes. This is the frontal, the temporal, the occipital, the parietal lobe. This in between is the central lobe, which consists of the pre and post central gyri with the subcentral gyrus. And hidden within this, in the surrounded by the opercula is the insular lobe. And on the medial surface, you have the limbic lobe. So we start dissecting from three approaches. I'm going to show you fibers when you go from the lateral side, when you go from the inferior side, and when you go from the medial side. And then I'm going to show you some relevance of these fibers while performing surgery. So when you look at the lateral aspect of the hemisphere, now all the gray matter in the depths of the sulci, as you can see here, has been removed. And you can start seeing the U fibers or the first layer of fibers, that is the short arcuate fibers, as they connect to each other through various connections. This is an image that was shown in that video. And you can see how intricate these short fiber connections are and how innumerable connections are connecting the various gyri and sulci. Now, if you see this image here, you can see how the middle frontal gyrus in this region connects with the precentral gyrus. The superior frontal gyrus connects here with the precentral gyrus. Similarly, the inferior frontal gyrus also connects here with the precentral gyrus. And how these three gyri, the superior, middle, and frontal gyri, connect to each other through these innumerable connections. So when you remove this first layer, when you remove this superficial layer, you start seeing these fibers first. So first of all, this is the vertical group. So as I said, fibers that are lateral to this will not go medial, and fibers that are medial to this will not go lateral. So this is your vertical group of projection fibers. Lateral to this, you will start seeing the superior longitudinal fasciculus or the lateral part of the SLF. This was traditionally called by Roton as SLF 2 and 3, but I like to call it the lateral part of the SLF as it is lateral to the projection fibers. This other fiber that you can see here running around and beneath the opercula is the arcuate fasciculus. So starting here near in the region of the inferior frontal gyrus, going posteriorly, turning and ending in the superior temporal gyrus region. This small fiber connection that you can see here is a connection between the inferior frontal gyri and the arcuate fasciculus. So your traditional broadcast connection. Once you start removing more grow matter, you start seeing these fibers more clearly. So you see this SLF2 or the lateral part which connects the middle frontal gyrus to the supramarginal gyrus in this region. The, here, this is another SLF that is connecting the inferior frontal gyrus to the angular gyrus in this region. And this is the arcuate fasciculus seen more clearly. Now, all the gray matter has been removed and you see the projection fibers and you see the SLF lateral part, the arcuate and this Broca's connection. There is another fiber here that is the ventral occipital fasciculus which connects the temporal and the occipital lobes. So this was from the lateral aspect that you reach the vertical group of fibers on the top, that is the corona radiata. And from the medial aspect, so the fibers that are medial to this corona radiata here are the SLF1 or the medial part of the SLF and the cingulum. So you can see how the cingulum connects with the precuneus in this region and with the superior frontal gyrus in this region. There are very constant connections with the cingulum and the parietal and the frontal lobes. 
So now, basically, if you understand this, if you understand that a localized group of glioma is ari arising from short arcuate fibers, it is displacing the other long association fibers, and it is confined to a gyrus or to the adjacent gyrus. We have Dr. Goel has devised this N mass tumor resection strategy for low grade gliomas, as I will show you in a couple of images. So you see this image here. This is an MRI image showing a glioma, a low grade glioma in the left supplementary motor area. So you see here, this is the central sulcus. This is the precentral gyrus. This is the postcentral gyrus. And this is the tumor that is classically in the supplementary motor area, as you can see depicted by this orange circle here. So now if you do understand this, you see that the glioma is arising from the fibers, arcuate fibers in the posterior part of the superior frontal gyrus. The corticospinal tract is displaced posteriorly and laterally. The SLF, medial part of the SLF and the cingulum is pushed downwards. So you understand this strategy and I will just show you a video where we have done an N mass resection, identifying the plane that this glioma has made and performed the surgery. In the initial part, we have used a lot of uh, uh, monitoring, but now as we are getting more and more experience with this field, the frequency of using monitoring has reduced. Because we don't have time, I will just show you the beginning, how the plane is being developed here. And as you go further, you can see a clear plane exists between this glioma and this normal precentral gyrus. This is the region of your precentral gyrus. This is the supplementary motor area. And you can see beautifully that a plane, you are able to develop a plane around this tumor taking understanding the anatomy of the fibers that are present and beautifully you will be able to resect this tumor in this plane. As you can see here now, the plane is being developed here. Now see the whole glioma has come. Beneath you can see the normal white fibers that are there. This side, the gyrus is completely preserved. There is no infiltration, there is nothing here. So this is a typical low grade glioma where it has been resected in an N mass fashion by developing this plane around the tumor. You know, now the whole thing has been resected and I will just go further and this is the last bit and the tumor is being resected and you can see this is the total resection of the tumor that has been performed and this is the transcranial MEP measured and you can see there is no change and the patient is absolutely fine with no deficit and this is the tumor. Similarly, this is another tumor. Now you see the relation of this tumor to the precentral gyrus. It is just abutting it. It seems to be arising from it. But if you understand this, that it is not, it is just in front of it and the tracks are displaced medially. Again, you can perform a N mass resection by developing a plane around the tumor. So now the, the pia is being opened by an arachnoid and you can see again, you can some, once you get experience, you are clearly able to visualize the tumor. You can identify the tumor. You can identify normal and abnormal by just looking at it under the microscope. And you can see this plane being developed here beautifully. You can see this is, this is normal. There is no, no tumor in this region, no low-grade glioma. And here this plane is being developed and you are able to beautifully resect this tumor in this plane that you identify. So in the beginning when you do, sometimes you will lose your plane. But as the experience develops, you will be able to understand where the plane lies. So this region here is the preserved precentral gyrus. You can see here completely that the precentral gyrus has been preserved. And now the whole tumor has been dissected out and removed. And here you can see that the whole gyrus has been preserved. And you see the post-op scan, and this is the patient with no motor deficit. So basically, the understanding help in devising the strategy for uh, low-grade gliomas. I will show you more further. So now we had come and stopped at the region of the superior longitudinal fasciculus and the arcuate fasciculus. So when you go more from laterally, you come to the region of the insula. So this is the insula that is hidden by the curtains, that is the frontal, parietal, and temporal opercula. Once you see how the insula is related to the vent parts of the ventricle, so this is the anterior part of the insula relating to the chordate, the posterior part of the insula relating to the atrium. This is the temporal horn. You can see the hippocampus here beautifully. 
And once you open the curtains, once you open the opercula, you start seeing the insula gyri. So this is the central sulcus of the insula, which is in the same plane as the central sulcus of the cerebral hemisphere. It divides the insular gyri into anterior and posterior gyri, anterior short and posterior long. So these are accessory and transverse gyri. These are the short gyri and these are the long gyri. So once, I've re once you remove the hemispheres, the opercula, this is the gyri of the insula that are surrounded by the limiting sulcus. So you have the superior, inferior, and the anterior limiting sulcus all meet here at the apex of the insula. So now I have removed the gray matter. The gray matter of the insula gyri have been removed. And the first structure that you see is the extreme capsule. Now the extreme capsule sends fibers. If you see this line here, it sends fibers across. So it connects the insula to the opercular. So this is the claustrocortical system of fibers. Once you start removing the extreme capsule, you see in this layer, this gray matter here that comes first in the picture. And this is a thin layer of gray matter that is the claustrum. Once you start removing the claustrum, you will see the external capsule. Deep to the external capsule, you see the putamen. And beyond the putamen, you will see the internal capsule. So let's start with the external capsule now. So I've removed the extreme capsule. I've removed the claustrum. And you start seeing these fibers. This is a typical spoke and wheel appearance you see. This is the external capsule. This is the region of the putamen. Now, external capsule is made up of two parts, actually. This is the dorsal part of the external capsule. And this is the ventral part of the external capsule. So the ventral part of the external capsule is made up of the uncinate fasciculus and the IFOF. So this is the uncinate and this is the IFOF. And the dorsal part of the external capsule has fibers that go beneath the arcuate and connect with the internal capsule to form this vertical layer that is the corona radiator. So this is your arcuate. This is the region of the IFOF. Now, this is another image where you can see all these fibers beautifully. So you see this. This is the SLF. This is the arcuate fasciculus as it has turned down. This region here, this is the ventral external capsule. This is the uncinate fasciculus. These fibers that are going posteriorly to the temporal region is the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. And these are, this is, these are fibers of the external capsule. And you can see how they're going beneath the arcuate to join the fibers and become the corona radiata. So in this region, I've removed the SLF and you can see the fibers of the external capsule continuing upwards. Now I have lifted the arcuate fasciculus. So the arcuate fasciculus has been lifted up. And now beautifully, you can see this area that is the sagittal stratum. So the sagittal stratum is made up of a series of layers. So you can see this layer here. This is the IFOF. Above it is the middle longitudinal fasciculus. Below it is the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. And when you lift the IFOF, you start seeing the optic radiation. And beneath the optic radiation is the fibers of the tapetum. So you can see all these relations now beautifully. This is the gray matter of the putamen, the dorsal external capsule, the ventral external capsule going on with the IFOF and the optic radiations in this region. And this is the corona radiata as it is being formed by the external and internal capsule. Now, all the layers have been removed. The arcuate has been removed, the external, the putamen has been removed. And this is the last layer that comes, and that is the internal capsule. So this is the anterior limb, the genu, the posterior limb, the retrolenticular portion, and the sublenticular portion of the internal capsule. This area here is the Mayer's loop. So now when you realize, when you come from laterally, this will be your last layer. Beyond this, you have to go through the internal capsule and the basal ganglionic structures. So this is the last layer that comes when you come from laterally. This is the internal capsule. This is the region of the Mayer's loop. Here you can see clearly. I will discuss this more in detail later. So now, basically, why is this important? The importance of the Mayer's loop is its relation to the hippocampus and the temporal horn. When we dissect from the inferior side, I will show you the relation more clearly. Now, if you see on a tractography image, this is how you will appreciate it. So this green is the uh, arcuate fasciculus, this yellow structure is the IFOF, and this red one is combination of the middle longitudinal fasciculus and the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, and it merges as it forms the sagittal stratum. Now, this is the tumor in the region of the opercula, in the region of the inferior frontal gyrus or the pars opercularis, so basically your speech area. Now, this is a neuronavigation image to show the exact localization of the tumor, and this is the tractography image that has been created. Another thing about these tractographic images is you have to learn to do it yourself. And the only way you will learn to do it yourself is if you know the anatomy. 
you cannot rely on a radiologist to give you this information you have to do it yourself and then you will know how the fibers are lying so this is the uh, image tumor and you can see all the fibers are displaced medially so this was the region of the tumor in the region of the pars opercularis here these are the main fibers that will come in the way so this is the dorsal speech pathway or the arcuate fasciculus and this is the ventral speech pathway that is the ifoc and both of them have to be preserved while performing surgery so this is a patient that we have not performed awake we have performed this patient under general anesthesia in spite of it being in the speech area with the understanding that it is arising from the fibers there is no eloquent area in the location and that we can do a n mass surgical resection without damaging any structure in this region so this is just the beginning of the video i will go fast so that we can hear the whole lecture now you can see the plane as you have seen in the earlier videos being developed again i tell you that there is no monitoring being performed in this patient just by anatomical understanding the tumor is identified a neuro navigation was used so that we get the exact boundary of the tumor it was just an adjunct tool but you can do it without neuro navigation in the beginning it's better that you use neuro navigation as it can help you as a tool now you can see the beautiful plane that has been formed here you can clearly see this is the glioma and beneath it you can see the underlying normal white fibers and now you can see that the whole tumor has been resected and masked there is no coagulation that is being performed most all the vessels that are eloquent are preserved in this location as you can see here and the whole tumor has been resected and mass preserving of the vessels is another important thing in glioma surgery and this is the post operative scan with all the fibers that are preserved you can see the arcuate here and the ifoc running and this is the patient and you can see his speech is also preserved ma'am batai pura with sir pura pura with sir shri ram ji here address mukam pasu surungao you don't understand the language there is a very mild dysarthria but essentially he is understanding and his speech is also ma'am batai pura so going forwards so this is another tumor in the region in the perisylvian region again you understand where the fibers are and you will be able to perform a beautiful resection this is a typical glioma in the insular region and you understand the relation of the fibers you understand how deep you can go and while you when you understand the anatomy you will be able to perform a radical resection as you can see in this image this is another small technical note that we had devised some time back when i was a little junior and i was doing insular glioma surgery i had some difficulty in identifying the perforating branches that are going on to supply the motor area and this i used icg to identify this vessel in this region as you can see here so icg was used to identify this vessel and to identify that it was not the vessel that was ending in the tumor it was going all the way to supply the motor cortex and essentially by identifying it and separate separating it i have preserved the vessel as you can see here beautifully and the tumor was excised so the, I, we don't use this anymore but as a beginner it might help you so we have done the dissection from the lateral side we have seen tumors of the middle and front uh, inferior frontal gyrus of the supplementary motor area and of the insula now what happens when you come from inferior the inferior aspect is very important for epilepsy surgery for mesial temporal lobe anatomy so we are going to look into that right now so this is the inferior aspect of the brain this is the collateral sulcus this region here is the parahippocampal gyrus the fusiform gyrus and the lower portion of the inferior temporal gyrus the anterior end of the parahippocampal gyrus turns on itself to form the uncus and you know the relation of the uncus with the cerebral peduncle very beautifully as you can see more clearly in this magnified image how the uncus is so close to the cerebral peduncle in this region so now i have removed the gray matter of the parahippocampus all the gray matter inferiorly has been removed and you see this some gray matter of the uncus the first fiber that you will see is the end of the radiation of the cingulum so the cingulum which comes all the way from superiorly ends here in the temporal region once you reflect this cingulum these fibers of the cingulum you start seeing the ependyma of the temporal horn when you remove the ependyma of the temporal horn you will start seeing the hippocampus in all its glory so this is the floor of the temporal horn you can see the head body and tail of the hippocampus this is the amygdala which lies at the junction of the anterior wall and roof of the temporal horn 
And when you reflect the hippocampus, you will start realizing that the Mayer's loop comes in the picture. So this is the lateral geniculate body. Fibers arise from there, curve anteriorly first to go in the roof of the temporal horn and then go posteriorly to form the lateral part of the temporal horn in this region. So this is a tilted image showing the Mayer's loop as it originates and goes in the temporal horn. So we had seen this internal capsule image earlier. So this structure here, which is curving anteriorly and going posteriorly is the temporal horn or is the Mayer's loop. And you can see it beautifully in this another specimen that I have dissected. This is the Mayer's loop and this is the central and the posterior bundle of the optic radiations. So why is this important, this Mayer's loop? Now, if you see this image, this is the IFOF, this is the sagittal stratum. You see how closely it lies in relation to the temporal horn. So this is the hippocampus that you can start seeing here. It is just reflected downward so you can understand the relation. So this is the optic, the Mayer's loop that is present in the lateral wall of the temporal horn and anteriorly in the roof. Now I've turned the specimen. So you can see this is the IFOF and the sagittal stratum and optic radiation in this region. And you see this area here in this region of the head of the hippocampus. There are no fibers in this region. Everything is in the roof here and posteriorly it is in the lateral part of the temporal horn. So this area forms a safe entry zone to enter while performing an amygdala hippocampectomy. This is another image of the same specimen and you can see clearly that in this region, there are no fibers. This is also the region of the amygdala where it will come. So here you can enter from the middle temporal gyrus and perform a safe, safe resection. So this approach has been devised by Professor Goel. And we've been using this for more than 25 years to do a amygdala hippocampectomy with a temporal lobectomy. So what we do is we enter in the middle temporal gyrus in this region. So this is a cortisectomy that has been performed. Of course, this is a larger one just to show you the anatomy. So you enter in this region where the head of the hippocampus comes, which is devoid of any fibers. As you can see here, you will see in the image later. And then you remove this whole part. You dis disconnect the amygdala. You disconnect the tail of the hippocampus and remove the whole lateral neocortex in this region in an end block fashion for epilepsy surgery. So now you can imagine I have turned the specimen. It is upturned. So you see the Mayer's loop here, this area here, where you enter from the middle temporal gyrus. There are no fibers and you can safely perform an amygdala hippocampectomy by disconnecting this and all the lateral neocortex that comes lateral to it. Again, this approach we use for performing tumors region, uh, for performing surgery for tumors in the medial temporal region. So you this, see this tumor in the region of the parahippocampal gyrus. We have, I have operated this going from a trajectory that between the middle and inferior temporal gyrus and a complete resection has been performed without causing any deficit. Again, another tumor, huge tumor in the parahippocampal gyrus. So if you see this image, you see that the images are, uh, the tracks are all displayed superiorly and you can safely enter here and perform a good radical resection. The next approach is the orbital cortical approach that we have devised. This is to approach deep seated tumors as I will show you. So this is the basal surface of the frontal lobe. This is the H-shaped cruciform sulcus of Rolando, dividing this into the medial, anterior, posterior, and lateral orbital gyri. This is the gyrus rectus. So we use this approach to reach tumors in the lateral part of the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. This we have been using for a long time. But recently we have realized that there are two ways you can approach the caudate head without causing damage to any fibers in the region and doing a beautiful radical resection. This will give you a shortest trajectory. There are other approaches. You can come interhemisphere, you can come contralateral interhemispheric, but the trajectory is too long. You have to go through the frontal horn, you have to go through the corpus callosum and then reach the caudate head. Whereas if you see from this orbital approach, this is the lateral trajectory and the medial trajectory and it will straight lead you to the caudate nucleus without causing any fiber damage. So this is the inferior aspect of the brain. Which fibers will come in the way? So you have the ventromedial portion of the uncinate fasciculus. This bundle here that you see is the anterior commissure. This is the diagonal band of Broca connecting the amygdala to the septal region. These are all in the depth. They will not come in the way. The uncinate fasciculus is also posterior to the frontal lawn. It will not come in the way. So what will come in the way? So if you see this, this is a turned image. This is the frontal brain, the temporal brain. This is the corpus callosum. This is the frontal horn. So in this region, when you enter from the medial trajectory, some fibers of the forceps minor may come to some damage. But if you 
understand the trajectory you can avoid this also and laterally there are no fibers as you can see this d here this is the ifof so if you come from this region you will completely avoid the ifof and will be able to enter the frontal horn and the caudate nucleus without causing any damage so this is just an example to show you a tumor in the region of the caudate head you can see the fibers that are displaced around it and this is the lateral approach that has been used to reach this and a total radical resection has been performed so we have seen from inferior we've seen from lateral now let's quickly see from medial so the medial part of the brain is the limbic brain this is the most primitive and the innermost ring of the brain that is the first thing that is formed during evolution and around it by by uh, growing in the frontal and the temporal region and dragging the temporal lobe behind the whole other neocortex is formed because of the growth the whole limbic ring is arranged in the form of a c as i will show you so these are the first gyri of the limbic lobe you can see the cingulate gyrus the para which the parahippocampal gyrus here continues as the cingulate gyrus and also continues as the lingual gyrus as you can see in this region this is the hippocampus once you start removing this in the medial aspect of the hemisphere you start coring out the thalamus you start seeing the mammalothalamic tract and the mammalotary body this is the mammalotegmental tract this is the fornix this is the caudate head when you see from the hemisphere so the cingulate gyrus has been removed and you can see the cingulum as i told you it ends in the temporal region here as the radiation of the cingulum so it forms a c and continues here to end in the temporal region continuing the dissection here mammalothalamic tract anterior nucleus of thalamus half of the corpus callosum has been cut to see the caudate head here then i have lifted the caudate head and you can see the anterior thalamic radiations so once you see this you will complete the whole papus circuit which begins here in the hippocampus goes as the fimbria the fornix columns of the fornix ending in the mammillary body anterior mammalothalamic tract anterior nucleus of thalamus anterior thalamic radiations going to the cingulum and coming back again here to end as the radiation of the cingulum in the parahippocampal region and this is the whole papus circuit that has been dissected this was done by me and dr sukdeep who is also co-author for all of us papers and we published this way back in 2000 well so limbic system basically we know the papus circuit but the limbic circuits are many you have supracallosal circuits i cannot go into the details but there are four major circuits and this is uh, the red circle here consists of three circuits that connect the uh, um, the limbic region so you have the supracallosal circuit you have the papus circuit you have the dorsal amygdala fugal pathway and then beneath that you have the ventral amygdala fugal pathway which connects the basal temporal and frontal brain so that i will not go into detail so this is again a tumor of the limbic region limbic lobe a parahippocampal tumor again resected by the approach that i had shown you earlier and you can see the beautiful radical resection that has been performed as i had shown you earlier how the tumors of the cingulum go along its connection so you see this tumor here it is going along its connection to the precuneus and you can see it beautifully depicted here this was again operated by us by an interhemispheric approach by the understanding that the fibers are displaced laterally and there will be nothing in the way that will come lastly the corpus callosum as you can see this image that the corpus callosum covers the whole encompasses the whole ventricle in its radiations and this is again a recent fiber dissection that i have done to show you the parts of the corpus callosum so i will show you in this image so this purple thing is the dorsal callosal radiation so these radiation go horizontally and then turn superiorly and merge with the corona radiata this orange thing is the forceps minor which connects the medial frontal lobes this yellow one is the forceps major major that connects the middle occipital lobes this pink thing here is the tapetum so the tapetum forms the are the ventral callosal radiation it forms the roof and the lateral wall of the temporal horn and the atrium and this green structure here are again ventral callosal fibers that connect both the caudate nuclei to each other and you see how closely they are related to this blue structure that is the ifof so the significance of this is if you want to enter do a callosotomy in this region that is anterior to the motor fibers it is safe again there is a region here in front of the splenium and posterior to the post central gyrus where it is safe to enter the ventricle and while performing a dissection this entire disconnection this entire length has to be disconnected otherwise there will not be an effective hemispherotomy 
So this is just a tumor. You see now, if you just look at this tumor, you will think, what am I going to do? I'll just come out with a biopsy. It looks so bizarre. But you understand how the tumor is. It is growing along the corpus callosal radiation. And if you understand this, you will be able to do a good resection of this tumor. This is the tractography image. And this is the post-operative image showing the tumor resection. Lastly, going to the brainstem. So we have seen all the fibers, major fibers of the supratentorial compartment. And now just I'll give you a quick preview of the brainstem. This is again a study that we have recently performed. And the dissection has been performed by my colleague Subdeep and by Dr. Nunes. They are beautiful dissections as I will show you. So this is the dissection of the pons showing all the fibers of the pons here. You can see the superficial layer of transfer spontane fibers, the corticospinal tract. And in the depth, you'll have the deep pontine layer of fibers. So what we did with this understanding of the brainstem fibers is again divided into three zones. So there was an outer zone here, a second zone two, and a middle zone here, zone three. This helps you understand the anatomy and how to enter the brainstem. I will just show you in some images. So this zone one, what did it consist of? It consists of short length projection fibers that connected the brainstem to the adjacent geniculate bodies and the cerebellum. So they consisted of the superior, middle, inferior cerebellar peduncles, the superior, inferior brachium, and the lateral lemniscus. So you can see here, this is the region of the superior and inferior brachium. This is the superior cerebellar peduncle that has been opened up in the roof of the fourth ventricle. This is the inferior cerebellar peduncle in this region. And these are all forming an outer ring of the brainstem. So if you imagine the brainstem, the first ring that is formed, zone one, consists of all these fibers. And this is an anterior image showing the middle cerebellar peduncle. So it is completely covered by this circle of fibers that is the zone one. The relevance I will just show you. The next zone is the traversing and long projection fibers. So there are two types here. One are fibers that just go through the brainstem. They're using the brainstem as a conduit to go from the spinal cord to the cerebral cortex. They do not synapse there. So you have the corticospinal tract, the spinal lemniscus, and dorsal and ventral spinocerebellar tracts. And you have the long projection fibers that have a relay in the brainstem. So the medial lemniscus, trigeminal lemniscus, the corticobulbar tracts, the corticopontine tracts, and the reticulospinal, rubrospinal, and vestibulospinal tracts. So let's look at their image. So this is a lateral image of the brainstem dissection. This first zone here, first circle, first fibers here are the corticospinal tract as they go from the pons to the medulla. This one here is the medial lemniscus. This pink zone here are the fibers of the zone three, that is the middle longitudinal fasciculus and the central tegmental tract. And this yellow circle here is zone one, that is the superior cerebellar peduncle. So going, looking at from it anteriorly. So in between these middle fi transfer spontane fibers, right in the center, you will have the corticospinal tract running from the cerebral peduncle to the pons to the medulla. And when you look from the fourth ventricular side, you'll have the middle spinal trigeminal lemnisca in this region and the vestibular spinocerebellar tracts in this region. And the last zone is that of the association fibers. These are fibers that connect adjacent zones to each other in the brainstem mainly. So this is the MLF, middle longitudinal fasciculus, the tectobulbar tract, and the central tegmental tract. They all lie in this zone that you can see here in this green circle. And the relevance of this classification is if you want to enter the brainstem, the first zone through the peduncles, through the superior, middle, and cerebral peduncles is safer to entry than from going from the other side. From the zone two, you have to enter through designated safe areas. You cannot just enter anywhere, otherwise you will catch damage. And zone three is basically a no entry. So based on this, this is our latest paper, a lateral cerebral peduncle approach to a ventrally placed intraaxial midbrain tumor that we have devised a new point to enter the midbrain. So you have a tumor in this region, in the ventral midbrain region. You can come from here, you can come from here, you can come from here. All these, this will all cause problems. This will give a very long tra trajectory. The basilar artery and the perforators will come in the way. So you have this region, the peduncle, which is divided into these three parts. These have the frontopontine fibers. These are your corticospinal fibers. And these are your temporopontine fibers. So we've devised a trajectory to enter to this region between these, in this, in the lateral part, lateral one fifth of the cerebral peduncle, working between the corticospinal tracts anteriorly and the substantia nigra, as you can see in this region, posteriorly. So you're working in this trajectory. 
and doing approaching the tumor which can be again approached by two ways one is the subtemporal route where you this is your trajectory that you will take to enter this area and one is the supracerebellar avenue where you can enter superior to the trochlear nerve that you can see here and you can see the trajectory that is superior and anterior to the lateral mesencephalic sulcus so this is a tumor just an example you see this tumor this was an oculomotor schwannoma so the approach we used was this lateral peduncle approach approach from here and a complete resection of the tumor without causing any deficit i don't think i will have time to show the video and this is another tumor in the peduncle a cavernoma as you can see and it was approached by a subtemporal avenue and you can see the trajectory here in the lateral part of the cerebral peduncle and a total excision of the tumor cavernoma was performed so these are the major fibers of the brain and i thank you for your attention thank you very much uh, professor uh, abida shah for this uh, very very interesting uh, presentation uh, i think uh, everyone uh, will agree saying that uh, we we need this kind of knowledge to uh, perform better and safer operations on our patients uh, is there any question uh, issue uh, do you, I you. yes yeah. I uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor, for such a wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, this was my, like, it, it was enlightening for me uh, to know about white fiber dissection. I have multiple questions, but first question is like, uh, uh, I was amazed with the concept of uh, glioma uh, going along the track. And uh, now uh, there is new theory that uh, we can do resection of glioma without damaging adjacent fibers. So like, in case of low grade glioma, grade one, grade two, by doing this kind of uh, resection, where we can get good plane along, uh, with the normal tracks, can we achieve complete resection and uh, complete cure of glioma? I, will, I think the paper has just been published in Neurology India. We have reported our experience with 74 patients. And I think mm -hmm. we achieved a supratotal resection in about 45% or something like that. And the others, we had a gross total resection. So supratotal resection we devised when we were beyond the margin of the tumor. And we could achieve it by developing a plane in quite a few of tumors. Obviously, glioma, you cannot say cure, but you are definitely achieving a supramaximal resection in quite a few of these tumors, especially if it is a non-eloquent region. Like if you have an anterior part of the frontal gyrus, you can definitely go in that plane and it most of the time is beyond the margin of the tumor and you can perform a supramaximal maximal resection. So based on it, my next question is like, if you are doing a right frontal lobe glioma and uh, will you do um, more of a removal of the uh, uh, normal portion of frontal lobe to prevent recurrence or you will do the same technique like same going technique. along the same, same technique? Same technique because yes, frontal lobe we are saying right frontal lobe, but still there is cognition in it. Still, if you have superior longitudinal fasciculus, your visuospatial, your mm -hmm. prosody, your music processing, a lot of functions are there even on the right side. And I would not like to just take it out just because mm -hmm. I want, you know, just because it is possible because we don't measure this in cognition in so many aspects. Maybe, you know, I'm, go I'm going to work on that to see how, and uh, there are people already who have worked on this. So we don't do it. We use this same technique to perform the resection. Okay. Okay. And uh, another question is in case of brainstem, like you presented a few cases of uh, cavernoma and uh, schwannoma, but what's your experience with brainstem glioma? Uh, like especially the diffuse glioma, they are present in pons or in midbrain part. We are not operating diffuse spontane glioma. We are not operating. We are straight sending them for radiation treatment. But for other tumors where they are surfacing to one of the areas where we can do, we have performed radical resection in some of these tumors by entering specific areas that we have identified by our fiber dissection. Okay. And uh, one, one more question. And uh, use of uh, tractography in those uh, diffuse glioma and using your technique, uh, maybe you can plan for uh, resection of at least partial resection of those kind of glioma because this point in glioma what happens is the pons has a lot of fibers and a lot of nuclei within it 
so you know mm-hmm. your, the chance of you causing damage is more you can maybe the tracks will be displaced i agree with you but to enter into mm-hmm. it and to go around all those nuclei is going to be a bit of a problem that's why we are not going and basically no. with radiation available just to get a histological diagnosis i don't think we should go in and remove a uh, diffuse fountain gap thank you thank you professor thank you so much yeah. Bida, I, I really appreciated your talk and um, also this uh, concept of a new uh, classification of aglioma tumors uh, based on the fascicles and tracts uh, who are involved. Um, I, I think uh, many of us experience the same, actually, uh, the fact that uh, gliomas uh, very often follow uh, some uh, white matter tracts. Yeah, my question, should... yeah, my question is, besides... Uh, this very uh, smart way uh, of uh, classificating tumors. Uh, how do you think this kind of classification will help neurosurgeons uh, to perform better surgery? I mean, um, we, we are not able sometimes to understand whether the tumor is just following the way of that tract, but just uh, displacing the tract, or if the, the tumor cells are uh, really involving the tract itself and, you know, uh, uh, not just displacing, but uh, uh, infiltrating. So is there any uh, way this kind of new uh, classification can help us in distinguishing these tumors? So what I think is for this classification in the localized gliomas, it will definitely help you because you identify the majority part, which gyrus it occupies in. You identify that and you get a plane and you resect it. The question arises in the diffuse type of gliomas, in the gliomas that are going along the track. So when you, are, when you have done fiber dissection, first thing is when you look at the radiology and you correlate it with the anatomy, you will understand which fiber it is growing. Like I showed you with the cingulum. So each one, even I have, I have images, I don't have, I obviously have not shown you, but I have images showing that the tumor is growing along the SLF, that the tumor is growing along the IFOC, the tumor is growing along the RQ. So you identify the tract that the tumor is growing. For a diffuse glioma, maybe you will not be able to achieve a perfect supramaximal resection because it will damage structures, because it grows along the tract, the tract extends over a variable lo- amount of distance. So you go where the bulk of the tumor is and try to remove as much as possible. Again, uh, N mass resection may not be possible in a diffuse glioma. Maybe you will have to do piecemeal. So that is a basic difference between your localized glioma and a diffuse glioma. Saying that the commissural fibers, the corpus callosal gliomas still can be resected in quite radically. If you understand how the fibers are for spinal glioma, I remember over my last few years earlier, we used to just go in and do a biopsy. But now if I have a spinal glioma, I will go in and remove it from both sides, from how much ever possible, I will go ahead and remove it. And it is possible without causing any problem. So for those kind of diffuse gliomas, we can go ahead and remove. So that is what we are trying to devise now. We've already published our work on localized gliomas and we'll soon soon come up with the other type of gliomas also, how to approach and how to go ahead with this. And the gliomas, this is basically a surgical thing. I'm not saying that the glioma cells will not go beyond the margin of the tumor. That is, you know, that is a, that is what you see in histology. They may be, they may, but we obviously cannot trace each of these and remove, start removing everything in the brain. So we are trying to come with a surgical concept, how to maximal, maximize your chance of removing the tumor from the brain. Thank you. May I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Hello, Alberto, and Hi, Raja. congratulations Hi, Raja. on this organizing this. And good afternoon, Professor Kato. So nice to see you. Yeah. One question to Professor Abida is regarding conducting research into fiber dissection, because most of these specimens rest with the anatomy people. And what is the uh, embalming method that special? Is there any special technique? so that you have this fibers coming out separately or it is normal. It cannot be a normal embalming procedure. So I just wanted to have this. Uh, so basically you have to, uh, you use Klingler's method. So you freeze the brain first. 
So you freeze a formalin fixed brain and then you thaw it and then you start performing the dissection. So basically the freezing separates the fibers. It separates the fibers and then you are able to perform the dissection. I have damaged hundreds of brains, Raja. I have damaged while doing this. I don't know how many I have damaged by missing. You know, when you are beginning, you will damage the fiber. You will go through the fiber. But at this stage now, if I just with my hand, I'll be able to peel you and tell you, okay, this is the SLF. You know, it comes. It comes with uh, how, how you're doing. I have done my share of damage to the cadaveric brains. Thank you. Hi, Avila. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Just I want to know because in Japan, it's very popular about uh, awake craniotomy, awake surgery, also intra orbit of MR image. So the most vessels can help uh, more uh, this uh, deficit surgery. How do you think about it? Uh, they're very good adjuncts, they are good tools, but it does not replace your anatomy. Because, you know, if you have, you can, of course, check once you are done the resection, you can check with an intra-op MRI. But what we are saying is if you understand the anatomy, you will, before seeing the MRI only, you will perform a good resection. The MRI will just be a confirmation. For awake craniotomies, for some areas, yes, you should do awake. We have been doing awake, but we are evolving. And in some situations, we are trying to avoid awake and see the results. And we are getting good results. But if the tumor is in the involving the arcuate fasciculus or it is involving the ventral speech pathway, yes, you should definitely do an awake surgery. And we are doing awake surgery, but we are evolving and in some portions we are able to avoid the awake surgery. So we are also growing in this subject and we will see how we come up with this. But all these are helpful. All of this uh, fiber, tractography, uh, intra-op MRI, sonography. We also have been using sonography sometimes neuron navigation, but these are for us, they're all confirmatory evidences. Like earlier, maybe two years back, three years back, I used to sit and draw the tractography images. At this point, it's in my mind. I don't even need the tractography because I know how the tumor has displaced the fibers. So that is how it evolves. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Abida Shah. And if there are no other questions, I would move to the following uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, uh, Professor Dishad Mabadaliev, who is not uh, only a colleague, but mainly a friend of mine and a friend of many of us. Mm -hmm. uh, Dishad uh, uh, is a, a neurosurgeon uh, from Uzbekistan. He works in Tashkent. He uh, did a clinical fellowship uh, at Fujita Health University of Bambuntane Hotu Kakai Hospital in Japan uh, in 2016. And later, he also did a clinical fellowship in Tubingen uh, in Germany uh, in 2019. Uh, he published uh, more than 20 papers. And uh, today we have the pleasure uh, of having him uh, talking about uh, the surgery of brainstem cavernomas our case report and experience. So, uh, Dr. Mabedaliev, dear Dilshod, you, uh, you can start your presentation. Nice to see you. It's nice to see you all, dear friends, dear Professor Kato, uh, Tushit. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you so <laughs> much for giving me uh, this opportunity to present our uh, short uh, case report. And I will be glad to share my knowledge about uh, brainstem cavernoma. So uh, this this is our uh, small experience uh, from brainstem cavernoma resection. So uh, uh, I will just go ahead and. Uh, okay, the overview, uh, we can say that these are uh, benign vascular malformations comprising about 5 to 18% uh, of intracranial vascular malformations and generally present uh, with focal neurological deficits. And uh, surgical treatment was firstly done by uh, Dr. Dandy uh, in 
1932, who resected a brainstem uh, hematoma after cavernous angioma bleed. And it is about 10 to 23% uh, uh, located in posterior fossa and most in the uh, pons region. Uh, and if these lesions bleed, they can cause severe uh, neurological deficits up to death. And correct management uh, of these lesions uh, vital. So uh, diagnostic uh, workup is basically uh, standard procedures, MRI, uh, tractography, computed tomography, and intraoperative uh, module, modules uh, like neural navigations, uh, motor evoked potentials and brainstem evoked potentials are very crucial. And so here uh, we have admitted 20-year-old uh, patients uh, with complaints uh, to uh, double vision, gait disturbance, headache, and vomiting, nausea. And uh, he was uh, a student. And mm, on MRI, we can see a right-sided uh, pontine lesion basically on the lateral half of the pons, uh, extending up to uh, right uh, cerebral pontine angle and compressing both trigeminal and superior uh, and middle cerebral uh, pied ankles. Uh, you can see uh, on both T1 and T2 uh, weighted images, uh, large mass that has already uh, bleed and uh, hyper intense uh, on T2 and uh, and of course on uh, sagittal uh, sagittal MRI you can see uh, large uh, brainstem uh, basically on the pons region and uh, compressing the cerebral pontine cistern, causing uh, brainstem shift. So, uh, on the in, in the literature, there there are uh, uh, specific zones that are called safe entry zones. And we have uh, very good appreciated from a previous lecture from Dr. Apitha. And uh, basically, we chose a, a supra trigeminal zone uh, to, as a, as a or, or peri trigeminal zone as a safe entry zone. And uh, and of course, uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring is very important. And we have used uh, motor evoked potentials, both somatosensory evoked potential and brainstem evoked potentials during the surgery. And regarding the procedure, so here we are uh, opening the right cerebral pontine angle. And draining the CSF, opening the cistern, identifying the trigeminal. And cutting the arachnoids uh, and getting into the lateral uh, surface of the palms. Um, the, the, the lesion itself is uh, through the uh, trigeminal safe entry zone and uh, using the, the sharp resection and both uh, aspiration and during this the procedure of course monitoring the trigeminal and brainstem evoked potentials and 
and um, Cabernet's malformation resected near uh, near total resection. Within the uh, hemostatic agents. And platinoids. And during the surgery uh, was slightly uh, instability uh, of the uh, pulse and uh, it was slightly bradycardia. Uh, that was uh, not, uh, that was temporary. And then we have closed the dura uh, usual fashion. And this is the post operative computer tomography. You can see a nearly total resection of Bernstein and Fontaine adenoma. And our patients, we have checked neurologically. And this is uh, the fourth day after uh, surgery. Hands. Before. And slight uh, cerebellar ataxia still present. So before operation, he had already a uh, decent nerve palsy and it is, uh, it was the same after surgery. So uh, no any new def deficit we have found. So in conclusion, uh, we can say the brainstem cavernous malformations are challenging brainstem lesions. Uh, once it bleeds, the bleeding rate is re relatively high. And radical resection and preserving normal brainstem anatomy is critical. Uh, using neural navigation and tractography leads to preservation of eloquent areas. Surgery at subacute phase is preferable. So uh, in our case, we haven't uh, neural navigation too, uh, but we have used uh, neurophysiological monitoring and uh, trying to save uh, the normal uh, long tracts and uh, fibers, white metal fibers. And uh, just, uh, we have tried uh, using the safe entry zones and the result was, uh, satisfactory. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dishad, uh, for this uh, very nice and interesting case. Uh, this kind of surgery is actually uh, very challenging. Uh, I think uh, it's important to point out the fact that uh, <laughs> probably we need to wait until uh, brainstem cavernoma uh, has uh, bleedings before operating, yes. also because uh, yeah, uh, the hemorrhage uh, creates uh, like a, uh, a way for the surgeon to reach the cavernoma. Uh, exactly. Yeah, I, I have a question about uh, neuromonitoring. You showed uh, you used uh, uh, neuromonitoring. I think it's uh, mm -hmm. of course very important to use. Uh, how do you how do you behave when uh, your uh, uh, potentials? Uh, uh, decrease during operation? W what are your strategies uh, in that case? Uh, mostly uh, we consult our uh, neurophysiologists. So how uh, okay, the amplitude or latency, uh, how uh, bad is the situation? We try to uh, ask from him. Uh, if it is uh, 
if uh, they can allow us to do further dissection and removal, we go further. And if it is like uh, latency is uh, prolonged and we should not go further, we just stop and try to take another safe entry zone. And uh, we try to uh, less uh, do retraction or no use of retraction. Uh, and uh, we just uh, wait and see. Will the potentials uh, recover or it it will be stable? If it is stable, we just stop on uh, we just stop on this uh, phase. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Yeah. Yeah. Issue. Okay, Raja first. Or oh, Raja, yes, yes. <laughs> No, the, the one thing that I wanted to mention is about the neuromonitoring in cavernomas. Now, when uh, Professor Lawton came uh, for this specific talk in our webinars, this question was asked to him whether he would continue or leave behind a piece in, uh, in case of any intraoperative neuromonitoring shows some problem. But Professor Lawton said that the risk of living behind a cavernoma is much, much, much worse. And it will definitely rebleed and you will have to operate them later. So as far as possible, even if a neuromonitoring shows any mild changes, if you have it in you, you take it out fully. That was the message that he conveyed during that lecture. So I just wanted to share it along mm -hmm. with that. So Thank you very much. Yes. It was a great case. Congratulations on the successful stream wall effect. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Yes, uh, this is uh, yeah. General uh, philosophy of uh, resection of cavernomas is total resection. I agree, and uh, I just wanted to point uh, point out that uh, if there is a critical changes like uh, decreasing uh, pulse rate and uh, anesthesiologic alarm then we try to uh, minimize our uh, surgical invasion that is the but the main uh, target is yes totalization yes i agree okay um yeah my issue. question is like uh, what nerves were monitored during surgery what did you monitor like mep other than MEP? yes mm -hmm. um Mostly, we monitored facial, uh, trigeminal, and glossopharyngeal, and oculomotor nerves. And uh, yes, brainstem adult potentials. These, uh, these are mostly we have monitored. Okay, and uh, like now they coming to the statement given by Raja that if you see alteration. And uh, even after uh, doing uh, changing your strategy, but now you have decided that the cavernoma must be removed completely. And while removing, the change in potential is occurring. So, um, what's your strategy then? Like, will you leave or go for the resection? Uh, in case, uh, if it is. Uh only for vital uh, vital uh, parameters like pulse rates and uh, tachycardia or bradycardia then we will stop if it is going to change on the cranial nerves we try to remove uh, completely nevertheless yes the the change yes Okay, then I rephrase my question. Then should we monitor those nerves or should we monitor only based on heart rate and uh, brainstem evoked potential? Because mm -hmm. uh, those nerves, they are also holding your nerves during surgery because repeatedly the, there is change in potential and you are also fearing that the, I am doing something bad and mm -hmm. this will change your strategy. Like, because yeah, yes. such kind of surgery, it is giving so much burden to your brain also. It's a complicated surgery. Yes, Heart yes. Overly. Yes, you are right. Uh, 
probably uh, we wanted to monitor the state of uh, these nerves during the surgery. Uh, and then not only uh, because they can lead us to leave some portion of the uh, cavernome, but only for evaluation, post-operative uh, uh, status of the nerves. Like what, 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 what has changed intraoperatively or postoperatively? Maybe for a diagnostic purpose. Okay, maybe for diagnostic. Yeah. 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 <laughs> also, also from a <laughs> prognostic purpose, probably. Also right? for prognostic, yes. Yeah. Also. But I, I also feel sometimes, uh, uh, of course, uh, EVO potentials and neural monitoring maybe uh, at the end will not change your final, uh, your final uh, surgical decision. However, I feel that uh, they can. Uh, Mod help you modulate your surgery. I mean, yeah. maybe if you if you see uh, there is an impairment of neural monitoring, you can just stop a little bit, do irrigation. Yeah. Sometimes uh, the potential recovers. Uh, so just uh, making a, a pause uh, during your surgery can uh, can be important yes, so, yeah. for the for the outcome. Even if, uh, of course, your final decision will be total resection, but I feel like uh, I prefer having uh, neuromonitoring as much as no, possible. Just you will be aware of the changes in the in the cranial nerves, and this may be helpful in some cases. Yes. Any other question? Uh, no, not question. Just uh, I want to ask uh, Abida Shah. Any comment for these shots? Okay, so the case was. Uh... Basically, it was projecting into the middle cerebellar peduncle anatomically. Okay, it was right in the pons coming to the middle cerebellar peduncle. So, what are your structures at risk? You first define that and then you plan your monitoring. So, you are entering in the peri trigeminal zone. So, definitely, maybe you want to monitor the fifth. You don't want to yes. go behind, you don't want to go, go below because the facial nerve will come below the peri trigeminal zone. If you venture, then you will come to facial. So, you can monitor facial. And the other thing that you probably want to monitor is the motor system, the corticospinal tracts. In this case, I don't expect any kind of change. If you're in the right plane, nothing, nothing will happen to the seventh. Maybe in the fifth, because of your retraction, there might be some uh, changes. But if you reach the motor, if there are some changes in the corticospinal tract, in the MEPs, then you better stop because you're in the wrong plane, you're in the wrong direction. Because it is in the middle cerebellar peduncle, if you remain there, you can you will not reach the corticospinal tract. So that is another thing that should you should keep in your mind. That if you know what is the structures that will be in problem, you monitor those and then rely on the changes in those structures. That is what I would like to share. Yeah, very, very useful and helpful comment. Uh, with, yes, we have to uh, uh, take into account the brain, uh, brainstem anatomy more than uh, intraoperative our tools. Yes, uh, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Apita. Uh, yes, this is very important. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Just I want to ask, uh, so many uh, the entry zone, the, the yeah. safe, safe entry zone, but the which the entry zone that you prefer? Of course, that depends on the uh, location of the, the lesion. But, uh, mm -hmm. According to your study, just, yes. just uh, we have uh, we have chosen uh, this is a peritrigeminal zone. Uh, regarding other zones, we haven't uh, we haven't used any other. Uh, I mean. We haven't used uh, other zone than peritrigeminal zone because we haven't we haven't had experience from other locations uh, lesions like we haven't uh, like medulla uh, oblongata cavernoma we haven't uh, operated yet and this is like a second or third case we have just operated so far and maybe. In in future, we can use uh, other zones uh, corresponding to the lesions, but this is our experience so far. Yeah, I'd Thank you. Like, like to add one more point from 
Professor Uyghur Ture. Professor, when Professor Ture came for uh, our webinar lectures, he mentioned uh, in one of his slides, the main message was, there are no safe entry zones in brains. <laughs> <laughs> I was like surprised. But then he showed his slides and he decides every surgery based upon tractography where to enter. And surprisingly, for a fourth ventricular lesion, he came from the front rather than going from the back, depending upon the tractograph findings. So that is one important thing I wanted to mention. It's actually an important this, message. This, this is absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely uh, that's he made an absolutely comment uh, yes but there is a relatively uh, maybe relatively safer zones and other critical areas maybe yes thank you very much are there any questions so some more questions for our speakers so if there are no more questions i want to thank both of our speakers today, uh, Professor Abida Shah and uh, Professor Dishad Mamadalia, for a very uh, nice lectures. Uh, they showed us very interesting cases, uh, and we had a, a very constructive uh, discussion uh, among us. So thank you very much. I want to thank Professor Yoko Kato uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Liu and Professor uh, Raja Krishnan Kuti for uh, uh, their support and organization. And of course, my co-chair, uh, Professor uh, Ishu Bishnoi. Thank you very much. And Thank you so much. I want, I want to remind you uh, our next webinar uh, in June. Uh, it will be on June 13th. So please uh, uh, make a note on your calendar mm -hmm. for our next uh, yes. webinar. Yes. Thank you very much to all of you and stay Thank safe. You.